Could a split in the Putin regime be occurring before our eyes? On Wednesday, March 16th, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that a peace agreement between Russia and Ukraine was, quote, close to being agreed. On the same day, Russian President Vladimir Putin made an angry speech saying that their military goals in Ukraine would be achieved. What does it mean when the Russian president says something completely different from his foreign minister? This video examines what this difference in language could mean and what it could suggest about what's happening inside the Putin regime. From February 28th to March 18th, the date this video was recorded, four rounds of peace talks have been held so far, even as fighting raged between the two sides all over Ukraine. On Wednesday, March 16th, the fourth round of diplomatic talks between Russia and Ukraine took an unexpectedly positive turn when the Financial Times reported that a 15-point peace plan was close to being reached. The top Ukrainian negotiator, Mikhailo Podolyak, said the agreement included a, quote, guaranteed withdrawal from the territories that have been occupied since the start of the military operation on February 24th, unquote. A day earlier, Ukrainian President Zelensky publicly stated that Ukraine would not be part of NATO and that talks between Moscow and Kiev were becoming, quote, more realistic. This is the first time Zelensky stated, flat out, that Ukraine would not be part of NATO. The top Russian negotiator, Vladimir Medinsky, said that, quote, the negotiations have been difficult and slow. Of course, we would like everything to happen much quicker. This is the sincere wish of the Russian side. We want to agree on peace as soon as possible, end quote. Contrast the language used by the Russian negotiating team with Putin's angry speech to government officials on March 16th. In this speech, Putin made no reference to ongoing peace negotiations. Instead, he again won over the justification of the war, and then angrily denounced traitors and warned against a fifth column attempting to destroy Russia from within, while maintaining that they would reach their objectives of denazification in Ukraine. The next day, on March 17th, when asked about major progress made in peace talks, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said that such accounts were, quote, wrong. Why would a Kremlin spokesperson contradict what was said by the foreign minister? Why would the tone of what Lavrov said and what Putin said be so radically different? How are we to read this situation? The differences in tone and message could be due to several possibilities. One is that the Putin regime has historically demonstrated itself as a master of misinformation and keeping opponents guessing by using mixed messages. On the one hand, Putin is saying, we are going to double down and do whatever it takes to win this war and maintain this narrative. On the other, Lavrov is saying, we are close to a peace agreement. This could be a deliberate tactic to keep Ukraine and the West confused and off balance. The U.S. State Department view reflects this understanding, with U.S. Secretary of State Blinken saying that Putin needs to de-escalate military action if any talk of peace is to be taken seriously. Another way to look at this is that differences in messaging between the diplomatic team and the Kremlin could suggest a possible rift inside the Putin regime. Russia is under tremendous strain right now. Military analysts have stated Russia is having real difficulty replacing military losses, a claim that is supported by the fact that Russia has asked China for military assistance, as well as by the announcement that Russia is seeking to raise forces from Syria to serve in Ukraine. Four of Russia's top generals have been killed. Such a loss of life amongst top brass is nearly unprecedented in modern warfare. Domestically, normal life in Russia has been upended by sanctions. A news report estimated that 200,000 Russians have fled Russia since the start of the war. This indicates the effect this war has had on the Russian population. Protests and public displays of defiance continue to sporadically occur, including on national TV. Economic damage from the sanctions have put the Russian state in a very difficult position, especially as time goes on. If Russia's position is apparent to casual observers in the West, it is even more apparent to members of the Putin regime and inside the Putin government more broadly. These people see where Russia as a country is headed. With this context in mind, Another possible way to read the differences in tone between the peace negotiation team and the Kremlin is that there is a pro-peace camp inside the regime that may not be powerful enough to challenge Putin directly, but the divergence in language is evidence that a rival faction is starting to be formed and that the positive practical negotiations between the Russian and Ukrainian camps is an indirect step being taken by this faction to put into place what is needed to challenge Putin in the coming weeks and months. An article in Foreign Affairs describes the rise of Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shogu, and it argues how, over the last decade, Putin has given the military a much more favored role in international policy, especially after Russian military successes in Crimea and Syria. Traditionally, the FSB was more influential in determining Russia's international policy with the West. Ukraine's Secretary of National Security said that they were able to stop three attempts to kill Zelensky after a source in the FSB tipped them off to the location of Russian assassination squads. If this is true, 
it would suggest the presence of factions inside the Russian government actively working behind the scenes against Putin's war. Moreover, in watching segments of Putin's speech, we can see a few things. First, his body language is visibly emotional and annoyed. At a certain point in his speech, he seemed to have so much to unload that the deep breaths he took in between bordered on hyperventilation. This tells us just how much stress he is under. His talk of a fifth column explicitly acknowledges that he sees and feels parts of Russian society turning against him. Always on the offensive, Putin frames this for his political base by invoking the old trope of class conflict, painting a picture of a foie gras eating, western oriented bourgeoisie and the true Russian proletariat. His angry threats to those he describes as fifth column and traitors suggest that Putin feels a growing danger by forces internal to Russia that are not directly visible to him. So we must ask ourselves, what does he feel threatened by? There are no large protests occurring outside the Kremlin currently. There is no immediate threat of a popular uprising. Putin is threatened by the oligarchs who have turned against him. The question is, what conversations have these oligarchs been having with members of the Russian government that Putin does not know of? Recent reports of arrest of an intelligence official could be indications of some kind of covert struggle being waged in the halls of the Russian government as we speak. As the workings of the Russian government are shrouded in secrecy, it is impossible to know. On things we can know about, the tone and language from the Russia-Ukraine peace negotiations indicates that a workable peace plan does exist. This plan will be important in the coming weeks, especially if reports are true that the Russian military will run out of resources to continue fighting, which will change the entire political situation and make the peace plan a much more attractive option to end the war. It would be in such a situation that any rival pro-peace faction in the Russian government might be able to challenge Putin directly or even to make him an offer he can't refuse. Thanks for watching. If you appreciate this video, please like and subscribe.